It's good to see everyone this morning. Um, I'm glad to be here and happy to be here. Uh, as you can know, that Pastor and Cindy aren't here this morning. They need some time of rest, amen? Amen. I told them last week, if you ever needed a, just some time off, just let me know and I'll come up here. So you're stuck with me today. Amen. Well, amen. two people said amen, so... Uh, I have my mom and dad here in my family, that's all I need. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I was woke up about one in the morning, and I just felt the Lord just filling my mind with a message about Him and His grace and who we are in Him and our position in Him. And it just seems over the last few weeks or so, a lot of things have been going on in the world and in my life and and I Lord has just kind of put this in my heart and I, I, I want to preach from my heart but I, I want us to know that we have a position in Christ Jesus Amen. that nobody can alter we've been taught a lot of times in the church that our salvation is required about what we do along with what Christ has done, and that's not how it works. I'm a child of God because of Jesus. Amen. I'm a child of God in spite of me. And I'm going to flip it around, and that goes the same for you and I, for both all of us here. God pursues us. We don't pursue him. But we have a position in Christ. And I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. Father, I pray, Lord, for your anointing today. Father, I pray, Lord, you touch my body. You know what I need. And I pray, Lord, for your anointing that I may preach your word, Lord, your word only. Lord, touch our hearts that we may know who we are in you. And Father, we worship your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before I get started, I want to do a little illustration about our position in Christ. And I'd like to ask my son if he'd come up for me. Now, he wanted to go home and go to sleep, but <laughs> since I'm still dad, he still listens to me. For those of you who don't know it, this is my son. This is Jason Jr. Do we look alike? I grow a better beard, just a little grayer. This is my son. Matter of fact, this is my only son. I have two wonderful daughters, but this is my son. He was born to me in Carmen. I was there when he was born. I was there when the doctor was there. My wife tried to play a joke on me. She's all hooked up on that crazy woman having a baby drugs. <laughs> and she thought it'd be funny to put a joke and say, have the nurse tell me that I was having a baby girl. So I'm pushing the doctor out of the way because I want to see if I'm having a son. So I was there. This is my son. If you talk to my son any length of time, you'll know he's my son. My son likes Gibson guitars like his dad. He likes Ford trucks and Ford automobiles like his dad. He wants to be a law enforcement officer. His dad. He plays the guitar. Like, well, better than his dad. <laughs> but this is my son. He's an answer to a prayer. Now there were a few years, about 11 to 14, where he wasn't such a good son. It was more of my wife's son. <laughs> but he grew out of it with a little coaxing from Father's stern right hand. This is my son. I love my son. I would do anything for my son. Except buy him the Gibson guitar that he wants. <laughs> He's pointing at Grandma. <laughs> Probably every day, it's almost every day, he's like, that. can you buy me my guitar? Now this is a Gibson 
Les Paul Custom, it's a $3,500 guitar. Daddy's not buying this guitar. <laughs> but this is my son. There are times that my son does things that I don't like. But he's still my son. There are times that he surprises me when he does things. Does them right. But this is my son. I love him unconditionally. And you know what? He will always be my son. From now to eternity, he's my son. The Bible says we're going to know each other like we knew each other here. So in heaven, he'll be my son. It doesn't matter what he says. It doesn't matter where he goes. It doesn't matter what he does. He's my son. Even if he goes to jail, even if he turns his back on his mom and dad and his family, he's still my son. And I'll always love him. And I know he loves me because he stayed a little later because I asked him to. <laughs> That's my son. We enjoy each other's company. I, one time he did a ride along with me for 18 hours. 18 hours he was in a patrol car with me. Everybody goes, what are you, why, why are you staying so long? He goes, hey, I enjoy being with my dad. That's my son. His position is, he's my son. Now, why did I do that? Because I have the Father standing right here with his arm around me to say, I'm his son. Not just me, but all those who believe in Jesus. And when I say believe in Jesus, it means that I've surrendered all to him. That I've given my life to him because he has pursued us. You know that old saying, well, I found Jesus? No, no, you didn't find Jesus. You were lost. He went looking for you Amen. and me. Amen. And he continues to do that. You know, it's funny, the first John 3, 16, I've quoted for many, many years, decades, and I never really realized that it said, for God so loved the world. I mean, I heard the words, so I said the words, but I didn't understand that. God loves the world. And he gave his only son for that. See, we have a position in Christ Jesus that wasn't given to us because of who we are. We were special, but it was given to us because of Christ. We are the sons and daughters of God because he chose us from eternity. From time past, before he even created the heavens and the earth, Jimmy, he already said, you are my son. He predestined us to be his sons and daughters. I know there's a lot of controversy sometimes about predestination, who's predestined to do it, but I believe we're all humanity is predestined. You just have to accept that gift of God. Amen. But you and I have a position in Christ that nobody can take away. Amen. No angel, no demon, no any other creature, no one can separate us from the love of God. Amen. That's God's word, not my word. In Romans chapter 8, it says those things. We are secure in Christ. We get too caught up in the rights and the wrongs and, and the, I did this or I did that. And none of that has anything to do with our salvation in Christ. I'm going to preach something this morning that you might not agree with. You might think it's, it's different, but I want to tell you something. When you give your heart and life to the Lord, it's for eternity. You're a son or a daughter for eternity. It's about His grace. The whole question has always been asked, can you lose your salvation? Well, I submit to you that no, you cannot lose your salvation. Well, what if I sin? God has already made provision for that, and we'll talk about it. See, you and I have to understand that, that God has made 
every provision we need and necessary to obtain eternal life. See, we are still working towards eternal life. We haven't obtained it yet. We have life and more abundantly here on earth, but we haven't quite obtained eternal life yet. Why? Because we're living, we're breathing, right? See, the last few weeks I've just kind of look around in the world that's going on, and I know in times past I've been asked this question, and I know a year ago, um, this month, actually September 2nd, I preached a message on um, things that we as Christians go through about um, stumbling and falling and mental issues and mental health problems and, and depression and all those things, and we need to understand that we face battles. We face cancer. We face losing a job. We face losing a child. We face losing our hope. And does that affect who we are in God? Sometimes in our mind it does. I remember I lost my job and I asked God, what are you doing? I wouldn't do this to my son. But see, God does stuff for our eternal well-being. We don't, might not know on this side of glory why we go through what we go through. But we have to do, just as that song said, I surrender all. I trust in him because he gave so much for us. We don't talk about what Jesus gave up for us, except maybe once a year. I'm going to talk a little bit about that this morning, what Jesus gave up. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with ever, every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. As I'm reading this, I hope you see here that the Father and the Son are doing a lot of things. First of all, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Amen. Right now, you and I are sitting in the heavenlies with Christ. Right now, as the Father is sitting on his throne, we are in there with Christ. We are sitting there with him in Christ. Do we understand that the Father right now is getting told that that is my son, that is my daughter by the, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? We are blessed. We are living in a life that is far beyond our comprehension, that you and I are sitting in the heavenlies with the Father in Christ Jesus. We have been predestined to adoption, that we may be the sons of God for his good pleasure according to his will. What does that say to you? What does that say to me? That, that means God has called us. He has chosen us. He is the one who has done everything that we need in Christ. And he says that he has made us accepted in the beloved. Who is the beloved? It's Christ. He made us acceptable. What, what does that mean? Ashley sang the song, We Are a Mess. I know, go in the mirror, look in the mirror, and got the tie straight and everything, and look pretty good. But boy, we are a mess. And God says, just as you are, come to me. Right? We come to him with all our sin, with all our hurts, with all our depressions, with all our whatevers. We come to him. Why? Because of he it has made us acceptable because of the beloved. He himself, by his will, has drawn us to himself. Church, it's not about us. It's about God seeking us. It's about him coming and saying, I love you so much. I am going to do something about it. 
in verse 7 it says in him in Christ we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound with toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he proposed in himself I'm going to switch jump over to verse 12 that we who trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory in him you also trusted after you have heard the word of truth the gospel of our salvation in whom also having believed you were sealed with the promise your Holy Spirit a promise does anybody know what redemption means we were redeemed what were we redeemed from death death the price the sin See, when you and I were born, we were born into sin because Adam and Eve, and there was a, a price that needed to be paid for that. God says, I have to pay the price. And we might un- try to understand, well, why, why all these things? It doesn't matter why God said, for the remission of sh- sin, there must be the shedding of blood, okay? So God has set something in motion that according to his will. So he said, I have to buy them back. They were, they were born in sin. Adam and Eve sinned because of that. I have to do something. And what God did is send his only begotten son, his only son, his precious son, his obedient son. It said before time even began, this was already set in motion. Jesus walked the shores of Galilee. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He preached the good news to the world and said, Come unto me who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hallelujah. Come to me. I will bring you back to a relationship with the Father because of the beloved Jimmy, because of what he did at Calvary. You and I can stand in a position and say, I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. It doesn't matter what hell tries to do. It says the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Amen. Why? Because of Christ and what he he has done. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Why is that significant? Because without the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are still men most miserable, caught in our sins. He is the one that applies the blood of Christ in our life that we may live for Him. Amen. I know today's message is a little deep because I'm getting a lot of blank looks. <laughs> but I want us to understand who we are in Christ. My son that's standing next to me. There's no greater feeling for a father. And I feel the same about, about my daughters. Don't don't tell them I don't love them like I do my son. I do. <laughs> Matter of fact, all three of them think they're our favorites. When Becca's home, she goes, I'm the oldest, I'm a favorite, I know, and you know Rebecca and Rhea and, and Junior and all those things, but the reason I use my son, I was hoping Andrea would be here today, but she, she was going to come, but she's not feeling good. My youngest daughter that's having my first grandbaby, so I'll excuse her this once. <laughs> but my son standing next to me, I get a sense of what it is for me to stand next to him. He loved me so much. The Bible says that Jesus was marred more than any other man in Isaiah chapter 52. He was beaten. He was punched in the face. His beard was plucked out. He was spit upon. That word marred means that his own mother would not have been able to recognize him. He was stripped naked. Church, he was naked when he was on the cross. It was part of the shame and humiliation that the Romans incurred on those that they were crucifying. He was whipped. He was beaten. If anybody saw the Passion of Christ, that is a pretty good rendition of probably what Christ went through. The blood that was dripping. And do we think that he doesn't love us? Do you think my position can be taken from by somebody else or even myself? The only way you can turn your back on God, the only way you can lose your salvation is you walk away. 
There are people in our society today are beginning to walk away. I don't believe in Christ anymore. Jesus said and Paul said there would be a great falling away before the end times. And we church, we are there. But you and I need to understand we have a master that pursues us every moment of every hour of every day. He died on the cross for my yesterday's sin, my today's sin, and my tomorrow's sin. He died that I might live in him. Amen. He died that I might live in the heavenlies in him. One day in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, this flesh will put on immortality. This corruption will put on incorruption. So I can stand before the presence of Almighty God. But until then, I will walk in him. Him. I will live in him. I will breathe in him. I will surrender to him because that is how we make it through this life. Amen. The other day, a few couple days ago, or actually a couple weeks ago, there was a young minister, 30 years old. Probably most of you have heard about it. He took his own life. He's 30 years old, had two young boys and a, and a wife, and they were ministers at a church. And when I heard that, I'm like, oh, Lord, please help us. Lord, let your grace about. I started reading some of the comments. It's going to hell. It's murder. Why are we letting people do these things? We're giving them an excuse. And I begin to sit there. And I begin to understand that God paid such a price. Why would we ever, as men and women of God, say God is going to send somebody to hell? Are you saying, Pastor, that if I do those things, that God will forgive me and God will... You know what? Yeah, I said I'm saying that. You know why I'm saying that? Because it's not about us. It's about the cross. Amen. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about the Father pursuing us. Church, there are things that we go through. There's, there's, um, there's mental illness all around us. Church, I, I, I work as a police officer. One of the forms we use the most is the 5150 form. I'm talking children, I'm talking adults, I'm talking senior citizens, it don't matter. People, for whatever, I, I, it's a spiritual battle we're in. That, that's, that's what I know it to be. It's a spiritual battle. Church, it's alive. A couple weeks ago, it was a Wednesday. I'm getting ready to go on vacation. My mind is already on vacation. And we get a call that this lady wants to hurt herself. I'm sitting there, and I'm like, Lord, what, what is going on? And when I find the car, we find the lady. Within a few minutes, she took her life with a firearm in front of all of us. And my heart is breaking. She was an older lady. She lived in a big home, driving a very expensive car, was a professional. But something in her mind was telling her. There was no hope. Church, we're living in a society today. The devil says I've, he's come to kill, steal, and destroy. Amen. And he's trying to attack each and every one of us to get your mind off Christ. He's telling you that, oh, look, you've done this wrong. Oh, you're doing this wrong. Church, let me let you in on a little secret. You're going to be wrong. Right. We're going to mess up. We're going to fall. And I'm going to say it. Don't be careful. We sin. Well, I don't sin, preacher. Well, the Bible says you do. And I don't say you, it says we. Let me just say we. I don't want you to think I'm pointing a finger at anybody. It's we. We sin. Why? Because we're human. We have a nature that we were born into us. That's why when Jesus died on the cross, he, it's called a substitutionary, vicarious death on the cross. That means instead of me and you and the world being on that cross for our sins, Jesus says, I will pay the price. Amen. So when the Father looks on you and I, he sees what Jesus did at the cross. Amen. Church, I don't know about you, but that is a wonderful thing. Amen. See, sometimes I think I'm doing pretty well, Jenny. 
just doing the straight and narrow and praying and reading. I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm doing good. Then all of a sudden, I go that way. I go that way. I turn around. And so what happens? His grace it says, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Amen. But the Bible says this. What shall we say then? Shall we sin that grace may abound? Amen. God forbid. We were dead to sins, but now we are alive in Christ. Amen. God forbid we walk in sin. God forbid. See, my son is my son. And he knows what's right and he knows what's wrong and he knows the rules of the house and he obeys the rules of the house. We argue about it sometimes and kind of fun about it, but he goes by the rules, but sometimes he kind of goes off a little bit. And sometimes dad has to say, no, you got to come over here a little bit. And that's what God does to us because he loves us. As a child or a grandchild, want them to not succeed. Anybody want to raise your hand? Little Jim Bob, you want him to grow up to be a good kid and grow up to be a nice man, serve God, and you want the best for him, amen? Right? Just like I want for my son. So what makes you think that our Heavenly Father doesn't do the same for us? Amen? We as Christians over the years, we just kind of thrown each other under the bus. Oh, you up, you did that, you're sinning, you're going to hell. Up, you did this, you're sinning, you're going to hell. Up, you did this, you're sinning, you're going to hell. That's not how it works, church. It works differently with us. Because why? Our position. We are sons and daughters. Now, God will correct us and God will chastise us because we are sons, right? I remember when I was a, a young man, a young, or, or a kid, or a young man, when I did something wrong, boy, I got the belt from my dad. Because why? Because 90% of the time, I deserved it. There are a few times I got in trouble for things I didn't think I did wrong, but that, that's okay, because I got away with a lot of stuff, too. <laughs> But when I went against what my dad said to do, and I did it, the, the supreme penalty was five whoopings with a belt. Easy. <laughs> See, it was funner for me to watch my brother get spanked than it was for me to get spanked. <laughs> but I knew that I did wrong. But because he loves me and didn't want me to wind up in handcuffs like some of my friends that I went to school with, he corrected me. That's what our Heavenly Father does. My dad never kicked me out of the house. He never told me you're not my son. He never said those things. And our Heavenly Father is the same way. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about Him and His grace. What is His grace? We always talk about, well, it's God's unmerited favor. What does that mean? I have no idea what that means. That means He saved me in spite of me. Jesus came to die on the cross for people that were sinners, right? We weren't good, we were sinners. But he died for us. He died for us. I know this might not be the shout message I usually do or whatever, but I think it's important we understand that it's about God. It's about Jesus. It's about Him and our position in Him. In chapter 2, it says, And He... And you he made, excuse me, slow down, Jason. And you, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of, who now works in the sons of disobedience, among also we all once walked, conducted ourselves in the lust of, the, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. What is this saying here? It said, in times past, before we were sons and daughters, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And we walked according to the course of this world. We walked according to what Satan called us to do. And we did. We did drugs, we did alcohol, we did whatever we did. That was because we were walking in the course of this world. We were rebelling against God. And it says that even according to the prince of the power there, who is that? That's Satan. But it says to, in verse 3, among whom we all, all of us once walked, 
or conducted our lives in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the desires of the flesh and the mind and by nature were wrath, just as the others. We were once that way. But this and this, verse 4, but God. But God. It didn't say but God in Jason. This doesn't say but God in Carmen. It doesn't say but God in Christine. It doesn't say but God in Eddie. It says but God. Right? Who is rich in mercy. But God, who is rich in mercy. Listen to this, church. I want you to get this. Because of his great love with which he loved us. With his great love with which he loved us. His love, not my love. I didn't love God. He loved me first. Amen. Amen. Even when we were dead and trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us together and made us sit together in the heavenlies in Christ. And in the ages to come, he might show the exceedingly riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ. But God, <clears throat> everything that we have, we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we, 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 we pray the prayer and say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he's making me a new creature in Christ Jesus. And he fills us with his Holy Spirit and he makes us alive in him. We are in a position to say, I am a child of God. I am a son and daughter of God. No man, no angel, no demon can ever take that away from you. Amen. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say this too. And it doesn't matter what you do. You cannot take that away from God. You are God's. Even if you sin, you are God's. Why? Because he already paid the debt. See, the devil wants you to believe that you're no good, that you fall and you fail and that you don't deserve it. Yes, that's all true. I don't deserve it. But God, who is rich in mercy... Wherewith he loved us with his love, made us alive. Church, it's not about you and I, it's about Jesus Christ. It's about walking in his grace and his love and his mercy and his peace. The world can't take it away from us. We got to live in him. Now, I'm not saying because I'm saying all this that I'm giving you permission to go out and do whatever you want. Because if you do that, trust me, God is going to take you to the belt. God loves us so much that he will do whatever it takes for his child to be back in line. Church, I know there's men and, and, and women and their families, they'll do everything in their power. Their son or daughter has gone off in drugs and they give rehab and, and rehab and rehab and, and all the things. Why? Because they want their child to come back. Well, God is the same way. God will do whatever it takes because he is the pursuer and we are the pursuee. His love. Only way I could describe that is how he pursues us is I don't want to get in trouble, but I remember when I first saw Carmen. That's who I wanted to be my girlfriend. And more than that, I later on I wanted to be my so I pursued her. I called her. I got my old squeaky car with the old squeaky brakes and I went to her house. Years later, my mother-in-law told Carmen, that's how I knew Jason was here, the squeaky brakes. <laughs> but I pursued her. I didn't want her to talk to anybody else. That's one, you, you could ask my best friend in high school, I said, when I first started dating her, that's who I wanted to marry. And that's what God does to us. He pursues us. He goes after us. He draws us. He puts things in our lives that we may turn to him and walk towards him. Church, we have a God that loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that we can live through him. But we have to walk according to what he's called us to do. Church, I'm not saying grace is where we can go out and do whatever we want. What I'm saying is if you're walking in God's grace, you're going to want to draw closer to him. Yeah. The great apostle Paul 
In Acts, I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to kind of talk about it a little bit. In Acts, it says that Stephen was being stoned, that it says that Paul was consented under their death. He was, he was the leader there, and he was giving them permission to do what they did to Stephen by stoning him. And then it says in chapter, or Acts chapter 8, I believe it is, it says, now Paul was sitting, consenting to his death, but in verse 3 it says, Paul, as for Saul, he was made havoc on the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Then Paul one day is going to the road to Damascus with letters to bind people who are in the way, women or children, and bring them back to Jerusalem. And he journeyed and he was getting close to Damascus. And it says that he saw a light shone from heaven and he fell to the ground. And Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul says, who art thou, Lord? Who are you? And we know the story that Paul asked Jesus, what do you want me to do? And Jesus said, go to wait for a man named Ananias and he'll come and tell you what you need to do. And Ananias came and healed him and taught him the gospel. And it says he was baptized. And it says in the next one, and Paul, Saul, went to their synagogues and began to preach Christ. I submit to you the reason for that was because of God's grace. Amen. He realized what God has done for him. Sometimes, Jimmy, I forget what God has done for me. And I'm probably pretty sure I'm not the only one. Amen. In Act, or Second, First Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says this. Verse 3 says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and by the twelve, and after that by over a hundred. Verse 7 it says, And after that he was seen by James and the apostles, and last of all he was seen by me also. As one by born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles and am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Listen to this. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen. Church, by the grace of God, you are what you are. We all have come from different roads and different places and different upbringings and backgrounds, but we all are all here by the grace of God. Amen. He says, but the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. I submit to you, when we begin to understand God's grace, we begin to work more abundantly than they are. Because we know where we've been and we know where we're going now. Church, God grace is on us every hour and every moment of every day. God's grace abounds. When our sin comes up, His grace abounds. When we fall and fail, His grace and His love abounds. Why? Because the Bible says, if we sin, Pastor talked about this not too long ago, he says, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. We have an advocate with the Father. We have someone who is sitting right now at the right hand of the Father. In Romans chapter 8, it says, Jesus Himself makes intercession for you and I. Amen? It says the Holy Spirit himself makes intercession for you and I. Why is he making intercession for you and I? Because if we sin, Jimmy, we have an advocate with the Father. He is standing before the Father. Satan is there. Says, he said, Father, did you see what Jimmy just did? He's a sinner. He has just walked away from you. He's not doing what you said. He deserves chains. He deserves death. But the father looks over to the advocate and says, what do you have to say? He says, I object. <laughs> I have something to say. Father, that is my son. He is sealed by the Holy Spirit. That is my son. I've already paid that debt. 
yes, I'm going to have to go down there and I'm going to have to kind of chastise him a little bit to get back on the straight and narrow. But that is my son. That is the promise you and I have today. Church, there is no greater feeling than knowing that your father loves you. It's, it just amazes me the older I get to understand that relationship about, with the Father. My Father's here this morning, and I'm probably pretty sure my Father's here this morning because last night I said, I, I'm preaching to all that. And he said, Well, I might make it. I said, I, I hope you do. My Father's here. Because I asked. See, I had a great relationship with my father. I still have a great relationship with my father. But because of my relationship with my father, he showed me how to have a relationship with my heavenly father. Amen. And I'm trying to show my son to have a relationship with his heavenly father. But it's not by my dad or by me, it's by his grace. Church, we serve a God that loves us so much. I, I apologize I'm not eloquent enough to convey what's in my heart what God has for you and I. I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm short. But all I can say is that His grace abounds when we fall and fail and He loves us. The devil wants us to think that we're not a child of God. He loves us. And the more that I'm understanding this, Jimmy, the more I want to do for Him, the more I want to just say, God, I surrender all to you. And those are hard words to say, Jimmy. Because I know what happens when you say, I surrender. The devil is just going like this, all right? I'm going to close. I know I've gone a little long, and I'm sorry. The last scripture I want to read was what I already kind of quoted. In Romans 8, 32. My Bible has a heading. It says this, the believer is made secure. The believer is made secure. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are all killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. Through him who loves us. Through him who loves us. For I am persuaded. That is one of my favorite Paul words, is persuaded. I am persuaded. Paul says, I am persuaded. What does that mean? I am persuaded. That means you can talk till you're blue in the face. You can you can quote scripture, you can do whatever you want to do, but I am persuaded you're not going to change my mind that what I'm about to say is true. Church, you and I have to be persuaded we are either sons of God and daughters of God or we're not. You have to be persuaded who we are in Christ Jesus. When we know that we are sons and daughters, do we not want to please our Heavenly Father? Do we not want to walk according to His will and His purpose in our life? Do we want to say, I trust in Him and guide me and direct me? Do we want to say, Lord, here I am. Lead me where you want to. I know those are hard words because I've had to say them. And sometimes I thought they bit me somewhere where I didn't want it to bite me. You all know what I mean about that. Lord, I want to draw closer to you. I want to do this. And then all of a sudden, you lose your job, you lose your house, you lose some things. And there you go. Getting closer to the Lord. Right? All happy about it. No, no, no. It doesn't work out well. <laughs> but when we really realize who he is and he wants to do good for us, the Bible says, Art, that we as dads, being evil, know how to do good things for our kids. How much more does our Heavenly Father want to do for us? That is a great scripture. My father wants me to succeed, and he will do whatever it takes to have that happen. Now, I'm not talking about cars. I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about home. We are blessed with a spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Yeah. Right? We 
We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's about the Father, and it's about in Christ Jesus. Our salvation is secure in him. You don't lose it. You walk away from it. You turn your back on it. You reject it. Because the falling away means you had to believe at one time. You were here, then now you're here. That's what apostasy means. You were once here in the faith, now I've rejected it. That's the only way, and that's what I believe. That we are secure in Christ. Why is that important? Why is that important, Jimmy? Because it doesn't matter what the devil says, it doesn't matter what anybody says, I am a son. You are a daughter. You are a son. And nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can take that away from you. You have to step away from that. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. Father, I pray, Lord, you just plant the seed in our hearts and lives, Lord. We're not, we're not saying, oh, Lord, that since your grace abounds, we can do whatever we want, Lord. I believe in my heart, Lord, if we truly are your sons and daughters, we are going to follow you with passion, and we are going to put our hands to the plow. We're not going to look to this world, Lord God, but we are going to look to you and follow what you have called us to do. Father, I pray, Lord, you begin to move in our church, Father. Begin to move in our hearts and lives and let us understand that, Lord, it's about you. And when we praise you and lift your name on high, Lord, you begin to move in our hearts and lives and we can draw closer to you. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your grace. Lord, it's not something that I deserve or we deserve, but it's something you've given us. Thank you, Jesus. Yesterday, we had some music playing, and this old song came on. I know probably a lot of you don't know who Alan Jackson is, but he's a pretty awesome country singer. And he sung this old song called, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Now, when I was a kid, we sang that all the time. And the word says this, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know thus saith the Lord." That's walking in his love and his grace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust him more. Church, walk in his grace. The enemy wants to come and kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus said, I've come and you might have life and more abundantly. Walk in that, live in that, believe in that, but in that grace, draw closer to him. I heard Brother J. Vernon McGee say one time, the best thing to do when you're in trouble with the Lord because, you know, I, I remember as a kid, the further you got away from that belt, and it was, that snap back, the more it hurt, right? Just saying, right? But the closer you get, the closer in you get, right, the less it hurts. What are you saying, preacher? Get close to him. When you get close to him, you're not going to get that. That, that would be part, right? Draw closer to him. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace. Father, let's walk in and abound in your love, Father. Lord, let's go out and win the world for Christ. Father, there are men and women and children and young people out there that need to hear Jesus Christ. Lord, they need the hope that lies within us. Father, Lord, we just give it all to you, Lord. And when we surrender, Lord, just use us, Lord. Lord, use us at circus night. Lord, use us at Bible study. Lord, use us at work. Lord, use us at the grocery store. Lord, that we may tell others about Jesus. Father, thank you for your son. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for going to the cross. And Holy Spirit, thank you for sealing me, Lord, knowing that I am a child, Lord, and we are all brothers and sisters in the Lord. 
In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Have a great week.